In this episode of the FanReach podcast, Kenyon Rashid, Brian Jones, and I have a chat with Fiona Green, the author of Winning with Data, CRM and Analytics for the Business of Sports. Fiona is an incredible font of information on why the use of CRMs, business intelligence, and data analytics is integral to the business of sports. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's get started. Yeah, so uh, the name's Fiona Green. Thank you so much for inviting me to have a chat with you guys. So I've worked in the professional sports industry for over 30 years now, because I started when I was five years old, obviously. Um, oh. I spent the I spent the first twenty years um, selling. I was selling sponsorships and TV contracts, media rights, merchandise contracts, you know, to licensors, etc. And I moved into this field of data, the use of data, about ten or eleven years ago, and oh, it was a wake up call. But but my abiding thought is always, I wish I knew then what I know now, because I'd have made a shed load more commission. Because <laughs> we apply data to the way we try and increase revenue, increase engagement, increase participation. And all of a sudden, the opportunity becomes not necessarily easier, because nothing's easy in sales, but it becomes more efficient, more effective, more relevant. And you can get to that end goal an awful lot quicker. And you can take the end goal and you can keep on growing it and growing it. So... Um, worked in the data field for 10 years. I had a, an interesting start, though. It wasn't um, because of the personal circumstances with the gentleman that employed me. It didn't go the way we were hoping it to. This poor gentleman, who was you know, quite an industry thought leader himself, he, pa- he, he passed away. He had cancer, and it turned out. And um, my personal journey was, so I'm trying to help um, the, the widow and the, and the poor gentleman who I'd known for 15 years trying to help him stabilize his business, which was a CRM and data consultancy, but I had no knowledge. He was supposed to be teaching me. So he was going to teach me. And of course, unfortunately, that wasn't the path. So I started this incredibly vertical learning curve. And of course, I did what we do. I Googled it. I Googled what is CRM? How do we use data? And I just kept getting adverts for Salesforce and Oracle and SaaS. And, you know, there was nobody telling me how does the sports industry actually use data? So I think it was about seven years later when I felt that I could talk with confidence about it, that I produced this one, Mm. thankfully supported by Routledge, global um, management and academic publishers. And my objective was to provide a primer for everything that somebody coming into the industry needs to understand, but at a sort of a foundational level. So Routledge supported me to produce a second version. And um, so that came out just about a month ago. The approach we take is, you know, people have years of experience, they have an incredible gut instinct, et cetera, et cetera. But the, and the data is not there to replace it. Mm-hmm. It's there to provide the foundation. And then we still use our gut instinct and we still use our experience. And sometimes we even do the opposite of what the data tells us because it's something we have to do for, for a reason that we're not aware of. But the, the point is of having the data, you can at least make an informed decision. That's the way we present it. And, you know, being flippant about it, I always say to my clients, you know, when you've got data, you can tell your boss they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> <laughs> the data shows, <laughs> boss. <laughs> yeah, but we, the, the big thing I say, too, is and we, we use the word data, right? It's a very ambiguous term. Uh, data can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think what we have kind of understood about data is, is it providing answers or validating a theory, right? It's you're either coming in with a predisposed uh, idea of what you're looking for um, and you're hoping to validate that through the data, or you're going to find something that you didn't necessarily anticipate that now you can react on. How quickly can we turn it around and who is interpreting the data? We are producing massive amounts of data for the first, I mean, like over the last, I think, five years, if you really look at databases and CRMs, we are producing massive amounts of data. Where we are having challenges is understanding how to make that data actionable across the board. Uh, Fiona mentioned a couple things. You have ticketing, you have parking, you have everyone is in their own segmented, you know, department, but they all want access to data that they can activate. So the data flow might be different going to ticketing in terms of what they need to what 
marketing needs or to what uh, retail needs. And so I think we're in an exciting area in time because you see data, you, you can't keep a data scientist on some staff now. I mean, these guys are so in demand because their teams and, and sports clubs are all looking for, okay, where is our next, you know, 10 season ticket holders coming from? Like, where do we find that out in all of this data that you're pulling? So I think we have a uh, responsibility in our world to kind of translate that data into what I call English, things that they can understand and act. I'm already ahead of the game then because I already speak that. So. There you go. <laughs> so that's why we're talking to you because the king's, the king's English. <laughs> the king's English. So uh, I think that is kind of what the next phase is. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I, I can't tell you how many companies that we come across that just throw the word data out, right? Oh, and then we'll give you data. And my, I always raise my hand and go, okay, well, what that actually mean? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by data? So, so yeah. So, so going back to the book, not that I'm here to push the book at all, but you know, one of the reviews that I constantly get is it's written, written in layman's terms because I'm not an academic and I write mm -hmm. as I speak. And, you know, my biggest challenge when I'm working with clients is is trying to help them cut through the clutter of the bullshit basically. Thank Am I allowed you. to say that, Christy? But yes, you, you are. Know, yes. Salesmen come in and they say, here's some technology, it's a silver bullet. Bang. And of course it's not. It's mm -hmm. not a silver bullet at all. So I mean firstly your your first point, Kenyon, there's lots of different types of data. And so my field is particularly what we call structured data and known data. So particular people he has bought a ticket, she has played a game mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then, of course, we've got the unknown data, which is the visitors to your website or your social followers. So they're not owned by you and mm -hmm. you don't have a particular box you can put them into. I mean, you do, you put them into a CDP, but I mean, they don't align with the ticket buyers because yeah. you, you've got to ha find that way to match them. So as a business and as an individual, I primarily deal with the known data. But of course, as we're getting more sophisticated as an industry, there's a massive overlap with the unknown data. So we're now working in both pools. But the data that I don't touch and, you know, I think is misconstrued as well is, is market research data. So Kantar type data. I think it's incredibly valuable market research. But, you know, I'm a big believer getting a focus group of 20 people or getting people of a thousand people to fill in a survey that says, what would you do if what do you think to is very, very different to actually looking at behavioral data and seeing how did people actually behave. And, you know, I, the, the, the sort of the reference point I give to people to help them understand the difference between filling in a survey and asking somebody what they did or asking a focus group versus actual data that's generated by people's ac actions it's like me saying to you brian what are you having for tea tonight and you might say i'm having steak and fries but then tomorrow i say what did you have for tea last night and you say i had pizza and when you told me you were having steak and fries yeah but i was heading home and i got sidetracked and yeah you know and so to me the Kantar type market research data is the equivalent of saying what do you think you're going to do or yeah. what do you think you feel or how do you think you're going to react but the data we work with the known the unknown that's structured is what did you actually do how did you actually behave and that's the valuable stuff that helps us predict you know the likelihood of people behaving the same way in the future so those are the the way i sort of split the data the known the unknown and then the anonymous which is the market research type of stuff one of the things that you had said that i thought was really interesting you, the way you phrased it was selling season ticket holders why does data matter and you know because the knee-jerk old school reaction is well it doesn't because w what I already know who my season ticket holders are and I just keep selling to them. But we were talking uh, in the last couple of podcasts about the fact that COVID is one reason that those season holders has changed dramatically. Um, and understanding now not just who bought the ticket, but the four people that came with the guy that bought the ticket is is now a vital piece of information to potentially go after new ticket holders and on and on. But you specifically brought that up, I think it was in one of your blogs about how data matters in the sales of season tickets. Yeah, I mean, it, it matters to, our position is it matters in the sale of everything and not just the sale, even the indirect as well as the direct sale, but just answering one of your points you brought up, 
and that's the impact of COVID. So we as data practitioners, um, you know, we create models of um, based on algorithms and formulas of what our customers look like and therefore and, and how they're likely to behave. And that helps us go after look like customers and stuff like that. And I think that's one of the really interesting post COVID discussions. And that's um, how the models we created. So say, for example, an organization, a team has got X number of season ticket holders and they've split them into six customer personas. This is what they look like, the type of behavior, the demographics, whatever. They're going to have to remodel all of that because pre-COVID, we thought the most important thing in the world was get into that game. Well, we might have suffered tragic loss and therefore get into a game isn't as important as it used to be. We might have happily spent 400 4000 whatever it is on our tickets but because of covid we've had to change you know our economic situation has changed so you know i think that whole modeling of what we thought we knew about people's behavior their thoughts their attitudes their spending power and their spending patterns is going to change we need to reassess all that data and we need to to change our models but back to the the specific question about season ticket holders so okay we have a number of season ticket holders that buy year in, year out, but we also have season ticket holders that churn, that, that come out, they don't renew. So we need to be finding out why they don't renew, at what point they make the decision not to do, not to renew, and divert them away from that decision so they stay with us. I already briefly touched on it as well, but this principle of customer personas, knowing what a season ticket holder look like looks like from gender, age group, distance to stadium, how much money they earn, what education level they have, their whatever family status, yada, yada. And then creating that customer persona and then going back to either our database to find lookalikes, people who look like this person and therefore have a higher propensity to also become a season ticket holder or using that data to go out to our paid platforms, you know, Facebook advertising, where they give us the opportunity to create a, a custom audience. Find me all the people that like um, football, that live within 50 kilometers of this stadium, that are male, aged this, earned this, have ever shown an interesting ban, because, you know, there's a really good chance that they're likely to buy a season ticket as well. So it has a huge impact. It's, you know, it, it helps us reduce the churn. It helps us find new customers. Um, it helps us to maintain engagement with those existing customers so they don't churn out. And actually, Kenyon, go back to um, something you were talking about. You, So we, we talk about data having two key purposes. One is business intelligence, which is the stuff we've been talking about. But the other one is targeted marketing. So we take the outcome of that data analysis, that, that um, BI, and we use it to inform how we get the right message to the right person at the right time to get them to do what we want, which is buy more, um, you know, engage more, participate more, or whatever it is. But So we kind of split it, decision making, informed decisions, and then targeted marketing, targeted messaging that, of course, is often related uh, to the decisions as well. Hey, Fiona, uh, can you mention how segmented um, you know, the data is from marketing up to parking to, you know, concessions. And it's, it's pretty fragmented here in the, in the, in the States. Um, do you find it's more consolidated there in, in Europe? Are people taking more control of uh, their data uh, as some are now starting to do here in the United States? And, and that's something we've been preaching for the last three or four years, owning your audience. And uh, you, you're seeing a little consolidation around that uh, here recently. Uh, what's the lay of the land there yeah. in, in but, England and Europe? So the principle is that, you know, your data is going to come into you in multiple formats because it's coming from multiple people across multiple devices, across multiple from multiple data sources. So it's going to come in whether you're in North America or Europe, it's going to come in from those multiple sources, okay? And it's what you do with it when you get it and then how many segments you create or personas you build. So the difference between segments and personas, for those who, who aren't clear on this, is um, segments are the, the databases or the, the, seg the, the customers that you create that you all want to do something in common. For example, you want them to buy a season ticket, yeah? And then the personas are the way you create uh, the different, the way you think of the different people within that, that segment and their mm -hmm. different behaviors. So you might have um, multiple personas in one segment, or you might have um, one persona and you use it, you divide it across multiple segments. So everybody's looking for the holy grail, which is the single customer view, the single view of 
that one person and how they've come into our environment, the level of engagement and behaviour. Um, so, the, you know, the, the fact that it's not segmented when it comes in is a reflection of how many different ways people have of engaging with us. It's what we do with it when we get it and the way we create that single customer view and then how we create either our segments or develop our personas after that. Here's an interesting one for you. And I, I love when I'm doing a workshop with a group of people, I love throwing out this question. So I'm going to throw it to you guys. So um, Netflix have 71, men, um, paying, 71 million paying customers, okay? How many different personas do you think they create to enable them to do that segmented messaging through their technology? So 71 million um, paying customers, but for example, I'm white female, Christie's age, two grown-up kids, I don't like Game of Thrones or anything sci-fi. I love CSI and White House politics. Christy, do you like CSI or White House politics? Nope. <laughs> so we're in the same demographic because of our ethnicity, our age and our gender, but we have totally different viewing options. So Kenyon, you and I might both like the same type of programming, but we're different gender and you know, so many other things are different about us. So straight away, we can see a number of different personas. And of course, Netflix want to get the right message to the right person at the right time to get them to say yes, as quickly as possible. So out of their 71 million paying customers, how many customer personas do you think they have? Somebody be brave and take a guess. Uh, Twenty million. <laughs> That's a really good guess, but it's not. It's not. It's um. It's too many. Twenty million would be too many. The cost of the technology and the processing speed to push through all that data and and create twenty million personas would render it non cost effective. No return on investment for Netflix. So it's actually thirty six thousand. So wow. 71, 71 million paying customers, thirty six thousand personas. We've got a retailer here in England called Boots. They're a bit like Walmart, online and offline, and they have this points card. So they have 25 million paying customers. Have a guess at how many customer personas. Go for it, Brian. Out of 25 million paying customers, how many personas? 25 million, I'm gonna say 5,000 personas. They have three. Three. What? And they're all female. So when Brian and Kenyon go into Boots and buy Aftershave, you drop into a female persona. Oh. <laughs> Even if you're not wearing lipstick and high heels, they put you in there. And, really? and, and it's not because they don't know you're female, it's because they don't care. Yeah. Going, uh. going back to the original point when we started talking about every business has a different strategy. You can't boilerplate things. So right. booth strategy is based on female customers. So the way they market their products, build up their stores, do this, do that. They're thinking about these three personas, Trish, Jana, and Wendy, or whatever their name are. And you drop into them. But of course, me and Christy will match it with a much higher percentage rate than you guys will, because if nothing else, you're not female. Right. So yeah. we'll drop into one of the three personas, and our match rate will be 80% or 60%. You two will drop into one of the three personas, even though your name's Brian and Kenyon, you'll still be classed. Is it because our spending habits lends our lends it to where we uh, we, we we match those personas? It's based okay. off our spending habits, correct? It will be spending habits. It might even be some of your age and gender, but it will be 100% your engagement with Boots, the way you look through their website, the points you collect, the way you spend the points, 100%. So the point I was demonstrating there is, we have these principles that are exactly the same. Data coming in, storing data, data being pushed out. How how that looks, whether it's Europe or North America or China or Zimbabwe, is down to the actual business. It's down to the business's own objectives, the business's own strategies, and, of course, the business's own resources. Because to do what Netflix do, you need a heck of a lot more resources than to do what the MLS does. To do what the MLS does, you need a heck of a lot more resources than to do with what some local soccer team does. So it all depends. The principles are the same. The frameworks are the same. What we do with data is the same. It's just it's framed differently to different organizations. So one of the things that we were just talking about in a in a in a previous episode was um, the huge leap forward in things like cashless and touchless technologies, and of course, that's of pretty big interest to a company that makes mobile platforms because this particular platform is is creating something that sports fans have in their hands from now because of COVID. The minute you park 
and pay for parking to going in the gate at the arena to finding your seat to finding the bathroom to buying a hot dog to getting a beer to getting your souvenir shirt and figuring out how to get back out of the arena in the shortest way possible to your car that's all here on a phone right so how important is that going to be you know it's pretty clear to the fan how cool that is and how that helps them um, but I'm assuming that that's a huge boon to anyone in the business intelligence unit trying to figure out what to do with people. They, they should now have a whole lot more information. But as BJ and Kenyon have pointed out in the past, that's not necessarily true because it's all different vendors that do those transactions on behalf of the teams so that data gets lost. So Given that, what what would you say, especially in your consulting role, to tell a team how important is that data and how important is it that they get their hands on all of it? Okay, so firstly, absolutely, it's incredibly important. By the way, mobile apps are the number one way, or using cashless in a stadium, is the number one way we can tackle that four tickets for one customer principle. You know, if we can get the three other people using the app and the app um, acquires data. So the reason I emphasize email, so firstly, e an email address is absolutely foundational because we need it for targeted messaging because mm -hmm. we use email, SMS, social advertising, mobile app push messaging and um, web advertising. Those are our targeted marketing channels. We emphasize email because it's the most cost effective, the most cost efficient and the one where we have most trackability. Plus you own it, yeah? Your Facebook followers are not your customers, they're Facebook's customers, yeah? Whereas when you've got an email address and it's in your database, it's your data. When it comes to a mobile app, if for whatever reason the mobile app provider has not decided to add to it a login place where we capture the email address, then they've got to come up with another way of getting a unique identifier that aligns with Ticketmasters, for example that aligns with the merchant fanatics, the merchandise provider. So it's the role of the rights owner to take that gorgeous, rich app data and be able to bring it into their environment and put it into a data, a data warehouse where it's also going to align with ticket buyer data, uh, merchandise buying data. They entered a competition on my website data. They purchased a ticket to a stadium tour. They came to a summer camp. So you've got to have a unique identifier. And to this day, an email address is still way more prevalent across all the digital applications we produce. Because even if um, a customer doesn't use email as much as another customer, for example, they get too many, they think it's all spam, they don't look at it. They still use an email address to actually sign up for the application. Unless, of course, it's WhatsApp and then you use your mobile phone. Um, and even when you use a, what we call a social login, a Facebook or a Google or whatever, you still provide your email address to set up those accounts. So when the app developer is offering the option to use a Facebook login, they can set what data they want to pull down from Facebook subject to consent. So of course they'll pull in the email address, then they can match it with the email address that was used to buy the tickets from Ticketmaster and they've got half a chance of getting that single customer view. Now, if you're more sophisticated, if you're at the start of this phase, you just think about email address because it's easy, easy. It's easy to match email addresses. All the email marketing platforms out there from the basic MailChimps, whatever, they only ever match on email address. So you shove all your data in there and you naturally create a single customer view without you having to do an awful lot more. But the weakness in that is most people have more than one email address. So, you know, I definitely have two. I mean, the industry suggestion is every person has 1.6 email addresses. Some people will have four, some people will have more. Um, so the ability to actually uh, match with accuracy is, is, is damaged because I might use um, Winners FDD for my merchandise, but then IPRM for my um, mobile app login. And, and we need to bring me together to know that I'm that person, that person I've come together. So if you're more sophisticated, you get into an environment where you combine email address with other data points, first name, last name, date of birth, postcode, etc. But if you're even further involved than that, then you can let the technology do this for you. If you're bringing in your data and you're providing microservices through your website, you can use a single sign-on. So you can actually have the same login process providing access to all these other vendors. Right. And the point about these other vendors, Christy, absolutely important. So here in, in uh, the UK and most of Europe, we're subject to GDPR. 
you guys, you don't know what an easy ride you have. If you guys are <laughs> panicking about can spam and the CCPA, you don't know you're born. Yeah. Because I, I'm staggered at how loose your data legislation is compared to ours. And, and I knew it was because somebody said to me four years ago, a very well-known and established gentleman in the world of data, um, Paul Greenberg, massive. He's, he's like the godfather of COM in, in, in the States. Paul Greenberg said to me about four years ago, if America ever had to stick to the same laws as you guys do, we'd be out of business. Our travel companies, our financial institutions. So I saw this for the first time myself. I made a donation to the Biden campaign. Please don't hate me or love me for that. But I made a donation to the Biden campaign. You have to give consent over here. You have to give consent to use data. I made a donation to the Biden campaign. His office didn't ask me for permission to continue to use it for campaigning to me. But he still sent me emails asking me for more money. Not only that, he gave it to every other Democrat party in the state. <laughs> a lot of emails constantly asking me for yep. donations. But here's the thing. They're not doing a very bloody good job because all the emails end up in my spam. Yep. So they're putting all this effort in collecting email addresses and using them. They're not putting enough effort in the actual process they're using because I don't see them going, they go into my spam folder. So um, bottom line is access to that third party data or the data provided by third parties is incredibly important. Here in Europe, we've got to think about the legislation behind that. You guys don't so much, but you do have to think about the format in which you're getting it. You're never going to get all your vendors to give you the data in the format you want. But if at least you've talked about the format it's coming in, you can put in place processes to manage it and manipulate it. So when it comes into your data warehouse, it sits there nicely. And by the way, just talking about your area, the app, app area that, that FanReach is concerned of, I was on a uh, conversation yesterday um, with um, the Draft Kings, and they were telling me they're dreading this latest move with app on iOS 14.5 and how the use of that data for programmatic advertising is going to kill like Apple's new legislate is going to kill. I don't think it's going to kill it, but it's going to damage, it's going to hurt the ad industry. The reason I'm not as concerned as you guys might be is because our legislation is way tougher and we still have a vibrant and buoyant third party data industry. Yeah. Mm. So, but yeah, that's something that you've got coming down the horizon with apps, new uh, terms for developers that people have to opt in. Well, and that privacy and, and being able to turn off the background uh, geolocation around geofencing. Um, I know Apple and, and Android are really starting to crack down on that. So a lot of the mobile strategy is all about taking that customer journey of identifying them at touch points across the, the venue experience. Well, if they don't opt in and we don't have that geofencing capability, it's kind of hard to get a sense of what they're doing and start to develop personalization around that. And that's what scares me. And then the adoption around the mobile platform. I mean, as they go to cashless, it's going to be more. But most season ticket holders are going in NFL may go to three or four games a year. And that's your chance to engage with them. But if they're single game ticket holders and they're buying on the secondary secondary ticket market, Ticketmaster just now opened up their platforms to the secondary ticket market to have sight lines into who those ticket buyers are once they leave the Ticketmaster platform. So they're still in the infancy stages of kind of generating a, a greater view of these of these fans. But the privacy issue, the opting in and then the op, app adoption of how do we get them to to download the app, be a part of it, engage with it, so we can start learning more about what their behaviors are. There's some of the challenges that I know uh, teams are facing here today. But I believe the opt-in is more for the advertising and the marketing. It is. So right. Still, yeah. you can still deliver a great customer service, which is knowing where you are in the stadium and stuff like that, then they don't have to opt in for that stuff. So it's really just the retargeting that, that that it's going to hit. But like I say, you know, we, we use the expression over here that when you've got to ask people to opt in for something, of course, it's about a value exchange. What are you going to give me for giving in me return. my return? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've just got to think about that. But we talk about a general conversion rate of opt-ins when it's just a form 
or a purchase or something like that, it's about 40% of users or conversion rate, between 30 to 40%. Anything lower than 30, you're doing a poor job. Anything better than 40, you're doing an amazing job. But of course, it changes with the um, it changes with the incentive. So people think, you know, this is all about the way people behave, isn't it? We think there's a definite state where people believe if when they enter a competition, they opt in, they're more likely to win, yeah? They yeah. think that yeah. perhaps yeah. the people holding the competition will delete all the people that did yeah. not <laughs> choose the winner out of the ones that did opt in. So there is this natural tendency to opt in. So I think for the app developers, it's going to be a case of making sure the value exchange is really clear. I mean, you can't, here in Europe, you can't, and I believe based on app, uh, Apple's terms and conditions, you can't make the opt-in part of a, an obligation to get a service. You can't incentivize the opt-in with something like you get something free. You know, it has to be a clear and free consent. Um, so you've just got to really highlight the benefits of, of opt-in in and see if you can get, you know, more to a 60 or 70 percent uh, conversion rate. But yeah, you'll never get a hundred percent. But again, it's just yeah. on the retargeting. It's not going to devalue the function of the app. It's just going to affect your ability to sell other stuff to them to yeah. the customers. What do you see coming down the pike as far as leveraging data? What What are some of the the new you know technologies that would allow uh, these audience owners, if you will, yeah. to, to get a you know. I love the word Kenyon always uses better sight lines uh, into who that, that customer is. So, I mean, funnily enough, when I was writing my, so in my book, I do a chapter on, you know, what's going to happen next, what's, what, what's next. And I'm not a futurologist. I'm not that smart. So I actually think <laughs> when it comes to what we're doing, I think it's just more, more and more, uh, more of whatever we're doing, let's do more of it. But when it comes to thinking about future state, you know, everybody talks about artificial intelligence. It's like this catch-all word, and it could mean, you know, this chatbot in Facebook. Uh, we're still at the very, very early stages of using machine learning. We create nice algorithms to identify propensity. That is like that much compared to how far we've got to go, you know. So, mm -hmm. but I think the application of artificial intelligence in its truest sense to the sports industry is going to be limited by our ability to cover our costs through the implementation of it. Yeah, because we've got to do things that generate a return on investment. Artificial intelligence is not yet at a stage where it's cost effective for most businesses. It's cost effective for Amazon, it's cost effective for Facebook. It's going to be a long time that that heightened level of machine learning for rights owners is going to generate a return. But yeah, of course, we expect to see that that move. I tell you, my my current hot topic that I love to debate, it, and this was came out of a, a, a US consultant who started this thinking, and you know, I, I'm currently reading his book, is um, data as a corporate asset. So at the moment, we think about how much data can be used to help us sell more tickets. And therefore, we, we use terms like customer lifetime value so that each person in our database we know is worth $495 over three years or whatever. But that's, that's how much money that piece of data can generate for us through the sale of other products and services or the sale of sponsorship or the sale of media. What about the value of the data itself having been a, a value that can sit on a profit, a profit and loss account? To, that could actually sit on your account. So this is there's this fantastic article written by this guy Douglas Laney. He's an ex um, he's an ex uh, Gartner consultant. He's a Forbes contributor. I love this article. I send it to as many people as I can, so I'll follow up with you. The title is "Your Company's Data Could Be Worth More Than the Company Itself." Wow. And yeah, and the book is called Informatics, and the principle behind Informatics is you know fundamentally the value of the data itself not the way we use data to sell other products and services. And I would love to be, if anyone's listening to this, <laughs> I would love to be part of the team that for a rights owner is the first organization to be able to put data as an asset onto a balance sheet. So over here, well, you over there, you know, all the buying and selling of clubs and stuff like that. We pay for the stadium, we pay for our players, we pay for our brand. We, imagine if we've got to pay for the data too. But we've been. And I'm working on commission, by the way. So you know, <laughs> well, Fiona, we've indirectly. That's what we've been telling owners from day one: is 
in order, if in the investment community, you buy audiences. Um, DraftKings, for instance, uh, started in Daily Fantasy, right? Um, FanDuel started in Daily Fantasy. They amassed user base for potential affiliate for sports betting. So when Patty Power came in, they really bought data. They bought users. And that yeah. value is based in there. So I ask, always ask the same question. What does Amazon own? Amazon owns audience. They run buyers and sellers at the transactional level below, but Amazon owns that customer. They own the customer data. It sits with them. They become smarter by owning that data. And so when it turns to what you're selling, so when I asked NFL properties or NBA properties, what, what do you own? It, you know, who, what product do you own? You own that fan, you, that, that's your fan. So whether he's interacting with a hotel on a road trip, if it's directed off of your website, that's your data. You should control that. And that is one that you leverage as an asset when someone comes in and values your franchise of what do you own? What do you show them? Same on sponsorship. We've been through sponsorship discussions with some of the top ones. One of my most surprising kind of experience is, well, what are you selling me on? You're, you're saying partnership, right? But how do you help my business? What data can you show me that's going to help my business? And they have none. They, they haven't looked at it that way. And I, I think what you just said is the paradigm shift that needs to happen in sports. If, if it doesn't, it, because that, that technically is something that they can control. And I think, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, we, we say ownership, but, but the data is, is yeah. the finding that user. So I've got two, two things to throw out to you on that, Kenyon. Firstly, that principle of a rights owner using their uh, customer database to drive sponsorship. Again, in this book, I have the best case study in there from Charlie Shin, formerly of uh, the MLS. He's now moved to one of the teams. I can't quite, quite recall which one it is. But um, they are <laughs> punching way above their weight in the way they use data for sponsorship, primarily driven by um, Charlie's vision. And, um, you know, it's it's... It's, you know, they're doing stuff like, so that stuff that you just said, helping your fans go and engage with your sponsors, directing them to the sponsor's website. Yes, absolutely. We wrote a blog about it. We're calling it changing the sponsorship dialogue. So yes, we want tickets. Yes, we want brand exposure, but we want your customers. We want to convert them to be mm -hmm. our customers. Yeah? yeah. But then the MLS go one step further. So, you know, this whole world of programmatic advertising is, is driven by a DMP, a data management platform. Okay. So you use a DMP to create your audience segments and you blast it out through Google ad net networks, et cetera. So <laughs> in, in this case study, you can read about how the MLS, less they've got their own dmp and they they work with their sponsors dmp to allow them to talk to each other so if you if you are an mls sponsor of course you want to ensure that your advertising that you're putting out is targeted to particular people with particular interests so they can borrow from the mls's dmp to pull in that information so that they're really highly targeted another thing they do which is wow um, we never, you, you should never, right, so owners should never give their database, give their customers actually to the sponsor. I, I hope nobody's doing that because, you know, that's just devaluing sponsorship. But what they do is um, in the same way that Axiom or Experian will sell you data points, yeah? So you give me your database and I'll tell you how many of these people use credit cards or have stock options or drive a Mercedes or take holidays three times a year. The MLS do that same type of thing. Give me your database, Mr. Sponsor, and I will enhance it with everything I can tell you about my customers if, if we've got the same common customers. So the sponsor will know who's a fan of which team, which which is who is their favorite player, you know, what tickets they bought. And then again, their sponsors can be really highly targeted with the way they get them to become their own customers. And that to me is, is you know, pretty impressive. I mean, I say it's groundbreaking. I know that in, here in Europe, Man United and Arsenal, they do do an awful lot with the sponsors, particularly on driving that customer conversion rate for them. I'm not aware of them going that next stage with the joint DMPs or the, the data enhancements. The other thing is, just going back to that principle of how much you know data is a corporate asset, it, it goes even beyond the value of the actual database. So your customers, it goes to stuff that you know about their behavior and how it can benefit other industries. And 
I try and think about the applications in sport and I come back to performance data. So not the professional teams, because the professional teams, you, you've got a roster and it's quite small. But imagine the grassroots of the sport. So, for example, US Youth Soccer, um, you know, there's 17 million registered kids. If they're actually tracking behavior, how often they're training, how often they're participating, that's hugely valuable to the insurance industry who are projecting the health of the country. No, serious. Yeah. Listen, so, I, I'm, I'm telling you, Fiona, yeah. uh, you are speaking my language right now. <laughs> so I'm going to, because we've, we've been on the, the optimization around player data as well in the early adoption from Catapult to GPS. And here's what I'll throw at you for data uh, around the business. So you're tracking NFL players, NBA players now, every movement, heart rate, distance, what they run, load, everything, all of that information they're going to productize that information downstream to the other, the, the, set, the kids that are growing up trying to figure out what do I have to do to play in the NFL or play in the NBA? Well, you want to do that. Here's his metrics. He's running acceleration. Yeah, 12 yeah. Three. He says, my question is who owns that data? Oh my God, Kenyon, I love it. I love this. So firstly, <laughs> I, I wrote an article for Sports <laughs> Media, which is one of our big, um, you know, one of the big digital newsletters. There's this, there's this class action lawsuit going on in the UK with the Premier League, okay? About 400 players. If you haven't heard of it, it's called Project Red Card. And Project Red Card is the class action lawsuit of these professional footballers claiming ownership of their data. Now, I think it's pretty clear, Kenyon, because here in, here in Europe, we've got GDPR, which is the law. And the law sits above any contract between a player and a club. And I, you know, I, I even started this conversation a couple of years ago, and I don't know how this translates to the American sports, but say, for example, Manchester City's buying a player from Everton, yeah? Mm -hmm. So Everton agrees the principle of selling, and then Man United says, but I want all his training data. I want all his biometrics. And Everton says, you can't have that. Well, the player goes, I say I can because it's my data. The GDPR gives me the right to take it and give it to Man United. Not only do Man United have this fantastic rich data on this particular player, a, re a clever data scientist could reverse engineer it and learn Everton's training plans. How do they actually? Now you're, you're hitting. So in 2003 or 2001, when HIPAA first came out, so I was the first one to go to the NFL and ask them, what is your plan around HIPAA? They said, what is HIPAA? <laughs> I had to explain to them. They said, that doesn't apply to us. We're no, not no, a health Explain facility. it again, please, Kenyon. I don't know. So HIPAA it. is the Health Information Privacy Act here that was enacted. Okay. So it protects your medical information and it prevents it be, from being disclosed without your approval. Well, we knew as players in sports, they talk about our medical records all the time. It's used as contracts. Yeah. And we are hurt a lot. So the medical data on us, what people didn't know is because we were being examined at the stadium and our records kept at the stadium, teams were classified as health facility according to the federal government. So that's the law that I went out with to get teams to move to an electronic HIPAA compliant EMR system. But one of the things that I did was make players aware that that medical information, number one, is worth money to them. So yeah. when they're negotiating contracts, we're looking at your medical data. They have a scouting combine where they take all the images and information, right? Players were not even, and their agents not even allowed to have access to those reports, even though it's them. But the teams were, and they were using it while you're being drafted. So yeah. when you turn on a, a TV today and you see a player go out of the game on the sideline and you see the 10 around them and they can't really tell you what the injury is, that's all based in HIPAA. That's all based in player medical data. So what I tried to say and to be an ally with the NFL is if you want to find out about injuries and, and safety and all of that, think about all the health data that you have available here, but the players own it. Yeah. So if I'm a player, I've told agents and I'm done at the end of the year, go demand your medical record for the team. Because when we retire and you file for workers comp or 15 years or later, you fall out like some of us do because we didn't know what medications you were giving us, right? Because you controlled all of that. If you put an audit trail, simply like player data now, whoop devices that are keeping track of your sleep, teams have mandated, non-mandated that you have to give the report the next day, right? So what when that first came out, my question 
and this was five years ago, BJ, yeah. was, okay, so you're collecting all of this data on the players. And the players are thinking you're collecting the data because of what? For performance? To make me better? Or are you collecting it to use for your own behalf? Did I give you rights to that? Yeah. Did, am I, I signing away my data? So when you tabled that question five years ago, then what sort of musings, what sort of feedback were you getting? What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Players are not thinking that deep, Kenyon. Yeah. What do you, what is, this they is going are. to help them perform better. What do you, what do you? You know uh, what though, right? Exactly. It's just interesting to me. Just two days ago, I ran across an article about a European soccer player who. Kevin De Bruyne. Yeah. Man City. Yes. Who was going to get yeah. cut. And he said, oh, hell no. And went back and had a data anal analyst look through his data to prove to the team what a huge asset he was and got himself. What was it? A five year? Okay, you got an extra 100k a week. Okay, so reverse that. Yeah. Now I know you're running a tenth of a sec slower yeah. in your acceleration. And by the way, I'm showing it on TV because, you know, the broadcasters, you know, we, we're going to show the acceleration. We're going to show all the, yeah. the metrics and the angles and the numbers and everything else. Well, the team is seeing that I'm running a second slower. They control the data of that, that they now can share with another team. Is that beneficial for me? No. But, but by the way, Christy, my question on that article was, where did the data come from? Because it's mm -hmm. unlikely Man City shared it. So maybe he got it from the broadcast. Maybe he went, he, the, the article said that his dad, his dad and his friend did it as opposed to an agent. Maybe they went through all the broadcasts looking for all that, you know, and, and used some sort of application to time it, you know, to make sure he got all that, that stuff down. But, but here's the question to you, Kenyon. So when you first introduced yourselves, you two as your business, and you told me what you did, you're not going to be friends of the rights owners if you go around. Well, listen, we've been, here's, we you know, I was 20, 27 <laughs> years old, mm -hmm. uh, presenting to Paul Tagliabue, the commissioner, Harold Henderson, lead, legal counsel, their entire medical team, and my thing was, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a doctor. What am I doing in this room? And one of the things was, I use my personal experience of what we went through. Like, I wanted to understand why we go in a treatment and training room. And I'm looking at you taking a report. Where's that report going? Like, how are you sharing that with another team? Like, when I got out, we both, Noah and, and BJ understands this, you know, we were told the teams didn't even have medical records on us. Wow. But what I figured out is that if mm -hmm. they can delay any workers' comp for two years after you get out of the game, the NFL has figured out that that's income not coming in for two years. If we can delay you that along, you will yeah. take a 30% less settlement on the workers' comp. So they've got it down to a science. And what I started to understand is, oh, they're looking at data that way. So why are we not looking at data that way? So, so do you know the funny thing is the dichotomy in the in Europe is the use of that type of data, the performance data, to help with transfer discussions and scouting discussions, to help with um, format, you know, how you play your team, who plays, who's on the bench, who's not listed, whatever. That type of moneyball data has been used in the sports industry here in Europe, Europe for years. Mm -hmm. You know, the smallest com com uh, club would have had Prozone before they even yep. used email marketing. So, you know, this is the opportunity over here in Europe. We, our rights owners are not using data for business decision in, in the same way they're using it for performance decision. You know, in. Players are a competitive advantage. That's what we know. So you talked about rights owners in sports. Are you in sports or are you in business? Mm -hmm. What we see here now is a shift of teams and leagues converting themselves from sports and entertainment uh, teams and leagues to businesses mm -hmm. without the foundation that traditional businesses have. So I'll go out and hire a data scientist. I'll bring Catapult in because it's the hottest and greatest things. But when it comes to, hey, well, what are you doing around your business analytics and data? What do you know about your customers? Yeah. Are you finding yeah. out the same things that you're finding about the players? And how do you engage them? I think teams and leagues now here starting to understand they have to take that step. I wouldn't have said that five years ago, because if you talk to some teams, they tell you, we don't need to market tickets. We're sold out for the next 20 years. Yeah. So what are you talking to me about data for? Our fans are going to come regardless. But if you see it and you see the advances of what's happening on the, the, the OTT, the streaming, the convenience around that, 
they are trying to up the ante around cash conversions of now that we may be able to get you to buy a ticket, can we get you to come to dinner? Can we start to get you to engage around our venues? And that's why you see sports and entertainment districts popping up around these sports stadiums because they're realizing I only have you for eight, 42 games in the NBA. Those are the only nights that I can engage and that's not going to sustain the uh, where this business needs to go. So well, that, that could help some activate their sponsors as well. Yeah. If I can give my sponsor now a more complete picture of who you are, that's more dollars uh, in, in our pockets from that 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 sponsor. And to your earlier point, Fiona, and you were talking about you know possible cross uh, cross uh, pollination uh, with the data, and and you know we've seen teams hoard that data. Uh, we had a conversation uh, about a week ago uh, with uh, the venue operator, and they've got all these different tenants and and they would love to have uh, a peek into that data of uh, one of the tenants who only plays, you know, eight games a year in that particular venue, but they've got uh, a a robust entertainment uh, cycle that comes through there, you know, annually. And if now we can use some of that data uh, to target your, your audience for this concert or for, you know, this hotel or, or this and that, uh, but you're seeing a pushback from, from some of the, the tenants, you know, we don't have to give us wholesale all your information, but I think it would make sense if I can give you a nickel back for allowing us, you know, some sidelines into your, your customer base. Uh, and, and now we can target them with these additional uh, events. Uh, why wouldn't you be open to that? Well, again, you can do that in the States. We can't do that over in Europe, yeah. not unless we've got... Well, we want to do that. A lot of people, some people are, are not open to that type of arrangement. That's that's uh, uh, one of the issues. I think it's back to sharing mutual benefit, isn't it? Right. Sharing, sharing mutual benefit. But, but yeah. back, circling back off your point, um, of the points you've been making, back to where we started the conversation about post-COVID. So everything you've talked about is the in-game experience, the at-venue experience. Well, COVID has... has pushed people's agendas so maybe these rights owners the ones that you know the ones that aren't the elite ones the ones that are perhaps middle tier and downwards they would have perhaps been thinking five or ten years from now what about my fans who live on the other side of the country or the other side of the world how do I engage with them because they're never coming to my stadium COVID's had to push forward that agenda because nobody came to the stadium so I think there's a positive impact that's come out of COVID for the sports industry and it's that Everybody who isn't Man United and can sell their stadium over 10 times has had to think about how do we get people to engage with us, engage brackets, spend money with us right. um, when they're not coming to our stadium. So one of our clients is a very local, a very small football club. So in the um, third tier. So they were thinking about how do we optimize the fans who aren't coming to the stadium? Whereas if they were still taking ticketing revenue, I bet they wouldn't have been thinking that way for a good couple of years. So now when the stadiums are opened again, they're going to be in a better state because they're getting the ticketing revenue. Plus, they've learned how to reach out to those fans who are never coming to the stadium anyway. Well, COVID accelerated this this uh, this paradigm shift. And and there's we were heading towards cashless and and and, you know, all the mobile uh, things uh, and, and COVID hits, and now you're, you've been forced, you've been compelled to uh, change your modalities, and 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 now you know get on board with this new way of of um, engaging your customer and, and and getting them in the stands. Yeah, between COVID and between the laws uh, changing in Europe, and I think the states very closely watches how these rules and legislation are affecting Europe. And I think a lot of that stuff is going to make its way over here. Um, It's kind of like in the States, every time California passes a law about cars or whatever else, you're not going to have like a car manufacturer is going to make one rule or one car for California and something for the rest of the state. So you guys are sort of leading the way. Europe is leading the way in how you know, the reality of what data rights and data usage and data rules are going to be around the world. I mean, and, and to be honest with you, if, you, if you're if you representing, if you're working with any, any rights owners that have an international reach and proactively target EU countries, they have to be using the GDPR anyway. So the NFL, when they do the NFL pass and they, they advertise it with a pound sign or a euro sign, that means they're proactively targeting our part of the world. So their processes have to align with the GDPR. 
Yep. So, you know, our sort of recommendation when we're working for US entities is build for GDPR. Build for GDPR. Why not build for GDPR? Then you're already ahead of the game mm -hmm. because it's coming anyway. And if you're an international business targeting any countries in the EU, you've got to implement it as well. Right. Exactly. well the, the NFL has to adhere to the, 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 those yeah. regulations when they pull their games there in, in uh, London? Yeah, because under the previous legislation, which was called the EU Data Directive, you had to follow the rule of your particular country, yeah, your, your headquarters. But under GDPR, you have to follow the rule of where your customers are based, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. If you accidentally have some British people in your database, you don't have to follow GDPR. It's when you proactively and specifically target these territories. So, yeah, the NFL advertise in euros and pounds. Yep. So they have to follow the same processes as we do. Interesting. And, yeah. and I, I looked this up. GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Perfect. And I've remembered HIPAA. Gold star for Brian today. Yep. <laughs> the student of the day. Now go sit in the corner. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Fiona. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was really Yes, awesome. I've got to get yeah. that book. That, yeah, that me is, too, I think. That, you, you very illuminating conversation. And, and thank you for uh, authoring uh, both of your, your, your books. And I'm definitely going to delve into them. Thank you very much indeed.